I'd like to read with you from uh, Joshua chapter 1, and we'll read from verses 1 to 9. So Joshua uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through to 9. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shalt not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Now I want to focus upon uh, one of the phrases from that reading. Uh, the words, be strong and of a good courage. Uh, it's almost a, a biblical mission statement, uh, a mighty motto for uh, believers to uh, just follow and to adhere to. And it's often repeated uh, throughout uh, the Old Testament in particular. Uh, for instance, uh, Moses, when he was speaking to uh, Israel uh, at the time of uh, Joshua's commendation, he spoke there in Deuteronomy 31, be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. But Moses also, at the same time, repeated those words to Joshua twice over. Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, neither be dismayed. And then, a little while later, after Moses had died, uh, the Lord spoke the words to Joshua some three times here in the chapter that we've read. Be strong and of a good courage. In fact, uh, Israel themselves, uh, just towards the end of this chapter, they repeated the words back to Joshua, be strong and of a good courage. And then later on in the conquest of the land in Joshua chapter 10, after the, uh, the kings of the five armies had been defeated, uh, once again, Joshua spoke to Israel saying, fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of a good courage. But it's not just in the experience of Joshua that we see, uh, hear these words. Uh, for instance, uh, Joab, he uses the words to David's army. Uh, David himself uses the words uh, twice over as he speaks uh, to Solomon. Josh Jehoshaphat uses the words to uh, his priests and uh, the Levites. Uh, and uh, uh, Shechaniah, also in difficult times, uh, uses the words to encourage Ezra. And so ingrained within the society and the people uh, of Israel, it seems, these words became, they even uh, were integrated into their spiritual songs. And uh, two of the Psalms, Psalm 27 and 31, both Psalms of David, include these words, Be of good courage, and he, uh, and he shall strengthen thy heart. 
let's just uh, consider what the words actually mean. And uh, we discover through the good books uh, that be strong. Uh, the root idea of it is to is to fasten onto something, to seize it. And so the idea perhaps is that they ought to overpower by strength or to seize on to courage, be strong. What about good courage? Well, the idea here is, is very, very similar, but it's got the idea of being alert uh, physically and mentally. Now, to be alert, of course, is a very strong message for uh, any listeners that we have uh, in England at the moment. You are to be alert and uh, you're, you're being compelled by the government uh, to be alert uh, for different things. Uh, of course, I, I can't help uh, being reminded of a of a joke that used to go around many years ago. Be alert. Britain needs alerts. So be alert. But it's to be alert. Uh, and the idea is to be determined, uh, to be obstinate, uh, to be persistent. And uh, they need to be strong and to be bold uh, and to be brave. In fact, those two words, be strong and good courage, as they appear in the original language, uh, are very similar uh, in their meanings. And in fact, in many of the readings that we've, or the quotations that we've already had, we discovered that they're used interchangeably uh, anyway. But here in Joshua chapter 20, uh, Joshua chapter 1, when Moses is now, uh, sorry, Joshua is now uh, 80 years old and about to take over the leadership of the children of Israel. And uh, he hears the words again. And it's not for the first time, actually, uh, because if we go back some 40 years in Joshua's experience, we discover Joshua and the children of Israel and Moses uh, at Kadesh Barnea. We'd read of it in Numbers chapter 13, and you may want to just uh, turn to it because we'll have a look at a few verses from that chapter uh, in a moment. But, but here in Kadesh Barnea, Israel has arrived as, after some two years of traveling from Egypt uh, towards uh, the promised land. And they're right uh, on the edge uh, of the wilderness of Zin. And tantalizingly close is the promised land just to the north. And Moses selects 12 spies, uh, a leader from each of the 12 tribes. And of course, uh, of the 12, uh, we have Caleb and Joshua. Now, don't forget that God has already promised this land to them. And he reminds them of it. And we read in uh, verse 1 of Numbers 13, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. It's their home. It's been promised to them way back. And they're traveling. They've traveled towards it. And now they're just about there. And Moses, he tells the 12 spies, he prepares them well in verse 18. They are to see the land what it is. The people, are they strong or weak? Are they few or many? In verse 19, the land, is it good or bad? The cities, do they dwell in tents or in strongholds? In verse 20, the land, is it fat or is it lean? And then again in verse 20, here it is, these words that we're focusing upon. Be ye of good courage. Now we'll just pause for a moment. Has anybody ever heard of the grasshopper complex? Now, as a teacher, I've come across many uh, personality and behavioral differences, uh, the likes of ADHD and autism, Asperger's syndrome, and uh, perhaps more recently, uh, new ones seem to come to light. There's ODD, Oppositional Defiance Disorder, and perhaps the one that I've most recently discovered, uh, PDA, Pathological Demand Avoidance. Unfortunately, it seems sometimes that 180 of the 189 children in my school have pathological demand avoidance. Ask them to do something, and there's no way they're going to do it. 
But what about grasshopper complex? Well, that's what we've got uh, coming up amongst the children of Israel. Uh, perhaps I'd better explain. In Numbers 13, they were told to go and search the land uh, which I give unto the children of Israel. And the spies, the 12 of them, they went into uh, the land to spy it out, and each of them knew that God had already promised to give them this land. And they looked it over and searched it out for 40 days, and then they returned back to Kadesh Barnea. And we see in verse 26 of Numbers 13, these words, they came before Moses, Aaron and the children of Israel, and brought back word. You can just imagine the anticipation of the, uh, of the children of Israel as they awaited news of the promised land. They've been traveling towards it, and now they were about to move into it. What would these spies have to tell them? Well, they weren't in unanimous in their report. There were two reports, uh, positive and a negative. A minority report and a majority report. Sadly, it was the majority report that was to hold sway. And uh, 10 of the spies, uh, they were happiness hoovers. They were aspiration absorbers. And they were going to set the children on a course that was most regrettable. But first of all, Joshua and Caleb, you can almost hear the enthusiasm in their voices in verse 30. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. They were itching to move on, to just cross the border and make the land their own. But then there were the 10 others, and we get their majority report in verse 31. We will not be able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. They had the grasshopper complex. And the congregation, they believe the majority report. If you go into the next chapter, in verses 1 and 2, we, we discover that they lifted up their voice and, cr and cried, that they wept that night, that they murmured against Moses and Aaron, that they said that they would have died in Egypt, or died in the wilderness, that would have been better. And it seems now that they've got the grasshopper complex as well. It's really contagious. Well, I suppose I need to explain, don't I? The ten spies, they brought that evil report that we read of in verse 32 and verse 33. What was it? The land, it eateth up the inhabitants. All the people are men of great stature. We saw the giants. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. The grasshopper complex. And why did they suffer from this ailment? Well, they saw that the Canaanites were better armed. They had horses and chariots and the trained army, whereas the Israelites, well, they just had staves. The Canaanites were better fortified. They lived in cities like Jericho and Ai. And the Israelites, they just had tents. The Canaanites had better physiques, it seemed. They were as giants, and how easily can a giant crush a grasshopper? But perhaps the significant issue was that they were seeing giants when really what they should have seen was God. And they turned away from their God-given challenge because of fear and because they thought that they lacked the resources to tackle and accomplish what God had given them. Now these, this grasshopper complex it's got symptoms, and they're a doubting heart, a distorted self-image, and a double mind. We'll just have a look at those for a moment. What are this doubting heart? Look at verse 31 again, Numbers 13. We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Now, just remember their immediate history. Just the last couple of years, 
God had never failed them, but had repeatedly delivered them. They should have known better. They should have known that God would fulfill his promises again. I'm reminded of what the writer to the Hebrews tells us about those who have a heart of doubt, uh, who are willfully rebellious. Hebrews 3.12, listen to these words. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Now, this was the experience of those 10 spies and the congregation that believed them. They had an evil heart of unbelief. But we ought not to despair because there is an antidote uh, to this aspect of the grasshopper complex. And the Hebrew writer tells us in the very next verse, verse 13, but exhort one another daily. Now we find ourselves in very challenging circumstances and for some uh, more so. But we still have the opportunity, whether it be on Zoom, whether it be on the phone or by email, or even just passing by somebody's uh, uh, garden gate. We need to encourage one another. We need to look out for one another because we are stronger and together. And undoubtedly, Caleb and Joshua, they appreciated one another's fellowship, togetherness, resolve, and faith. And we need to learn from that also. But then another aspect of this complex of theirs was uh, a distorted self-image. Look at verse 33 of Numbers 13. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Now, you might think, first of all, that this is them being humble, but it wasn't. It was really their unbelief. Remember, once again, that God had promised to give them this land. Actually, they were wrong about what the Canaanites thought about the children of Israel. And we get a glimpse of the true uh, thoughts of this people concerning God's people, uh, when we jump 40 years ahead uh, and hear the words of Rahab, because uh, she speaks on behalf of the citizens of Jericho and of the, uh, the, the country at large, uh, when she says to the two spies that uh, came into her, her household, that your terror is fallen upon us, all the inhabitants faint. Our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man. She knew that actually this land, the people of this land were quaking in their boots because of the coming of the children of Israel. Why? Because they were a superior army? No. She gives the answer herself in her own words. The Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and earth below. It's remarkable, isn't it, that this woman recognized that from the things that she saw and had heard about the children of Israel, but the children of Israel who themselves had experienced these things didn't have the same faith. And so we need also ourselves, having experienced so much, so many blessings, so much goodness at the hand of our God, that we likewise are blessed. And in the words of uh, uh, Romans 8.37, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And someone has written, remember, if we believe that Satan is unbeatable, he is. Thirdly, they suffered from a double mind. And uh, their responses, the children of Israel, uh, to the news from the ten spies, uh, recorded in the early part of uh, chapter 14, Numbers 14, uh, are, are just responses of confusion. It shows their double-mindedness. For instance, in verse 2, they wish that they had died in the land of Egypt, and then immediately say that we had died in the wilderness. 
And then in verse 3, better that we return into Egypt. And then verse 4, let us make a captain. And it, it seems that they're just grasping for something. God is at hand. And he has delivered them time and time again. He is there for them. He has promised to them. Well, James writes about this kind of uh, aspect of uh, their condition. When he writes in uh, James chapter 1 and verse 8, that a double-minded man is unstable in it all his ways. And the children of Israel are showing that instability. But James uh, just like the Hebrew writer does give a prescription that can remedy this uh, aspect of the complex. And uh, he says in uh, James chapter 1 and verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and then let him ask in faith. Nothing we bring. And so we have at hand a God who uh, knows our needs, understands our needs, understands our doubts, understands our failings, and yet he is offering to us that opportunity to come to him, seek him up, seek his heart, and seek wisdom. We really need to be like Caleb and Joshua, and we read of them back in Numbers 14 and verse 8, these words that they spoke. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear he. Sadly, though, these the people, the children of Israel, uh, they believed in that majority report, the negative report, and not in the words of Caleb and Joshua of Moses, or even of God. And they refused, and they rebelled, and it resulted in the wilderness being their residence for the next 40 years. So that not one person, other than Joshua and Caleb, over the age of 20 years old, entered into the promised land some 40 years later. And so we come back to where we started on the banks of the River Jordan, just to the east of Canaan. And Joshua is their new leader. I just wonder how Joshua felt. Did he feel at all inadequate? The task that was at hand, the new leader of this great people, about to go into the land, responsible for leading the conquest of it. After all, in his mind would have been Moses and his leadership and all of the things that had happened under that leadership, how that Moses had stood before Pharaoh, how that he had brought about the 10 plagues that had led to their release and stood at the banks of the Red Sea and with his staff had stretched, opened it up so that the people could cross. Moses had met with God on the top of Sinai. Moses had brought to the camp the Ten Commandments. And Moses for 40 years had dealt with a troublesome congregation. And now it was Joshua's turn. I just wonder, are there times when we feel inadequate, uh, unable, unprepared, ill-equipped, without strength, to do the things that we know we ought to do in our service for God. And then we find ourselves now in very difficult circumstances, very challenging and very, very different to uh, what we're used to. Well, we've been given a commission. And the Lord Jesus spoke to the disciples just before he left them. We read of it in Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I just wonder sometimes, do we do nothing because we're afraid to fail? Well, God knew Joshua, and God knew just what he needed, however he was actually feeling. And 
God took time to encourage Joshua. And that's what the opening verses of Joshua chapter 1 are all about. And God gives him a promise of his presence. And he gives him a promise of prosperity. And we just take a few moments to consider those. So promise of God's promise, uh, a promise of God's presence. We're back in Joshua chapter 1 now. And verse 1 tells us that the Lord spake unto Joshua. Well, I think that's just wonderful in itself. The handover has happened. Moses is dead. And that moment of uncertainty is brought to an end to a degree when God speaks uh, to Joshua. And he relays a promise. We read of it in verse 5. And this is a wonderful, wonderful reassurance for Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Of course, the reality is, is that God could never forsake. And could, God could never fail because of the, his intrinsic nature, his faithfulness, his steadfastness. But it's still good to know. And still good to be reassured of that. And God, whilst he is unfailing, and whilst he is strong, yet he understands and knows that we are weak and we are frail. And so he will speak to us in that moment of need. Even though God was uh, uh, promising to be with Joshua, yet there was a responsibility that he had to live up to. And in verse 6, God speaks to him. And again in verse 7 and verse 9. And he speaks these words that we've already been thinking about. Be strong and of a good courage. Now, I think it's really important to appreciate that the source of, of this strength, of this courage, is not from within Joshua, but that it comes from God. Certainly he has to respond and move towards God. But the basis of the strength and the boldness isn't innate to Joshua. In fact, I think we get the clue as to why it is he can be strong and can be bold. It's verse 9. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That's the secret. However, there's a degree to which the Lord's presence and his strengthening is conditional. Verse 7. Turn not from it. Turn not from the law to thy right hand or to the left. And clearly to appreciate and know the promise of the presence of God in his life and in his experience, he had to be obedient. God would always be there. But of course, the perception of his presence would waver with disobedience. And really, it's the same for us, isn't it? It's true for us. And again, it's conditional. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, listen to the words, Let your behavior be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Our obedience to him ensures our appreciation of his presence, God's promise of his presence. But Joshua also had God's promise of prosperity or of success. There were no ifs and buts as to whether or not God was with him and with obedience, he would be victorious and he would prosper. Verse 7 again that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse 8, that thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. In order for 
him to know the fulfillment uh, of uh, these, this message, then there had to be a conditions. And perhaps we can glean these ideas from the verses. Joshua, Joshua needed to know God's word, to talk about God's word, to meditate upon God's word, and to obey God's word. Let's just think of the first of those, to know God's word. This is really implicit in the message of verses 7 and 8. The law was to be Joshua's guidebook, and he would have known what it said. Of course, he had to know what it said in order to obey it. And in some respects, Joshua's experience was very similar to us in that he had access to the written word of God, at least the very first part of it. Josh, uh, Moses had written these things down, we read of it at the close of Deuteronomy. And so Joshua had access to the word of God. He could read it for himself and so choose to, and so know it and then to obey it. And of course, we have wonderful access to the word of God and we must make the most of the facilities that we have, whether on the written page or in an app or whatever it might be, but to know the word of God. Secondly, to talk about the word of God, verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. And so the idea perhaps is that his conversation needed to be saturated with God's word. Well, is that true about us? Or do we only talk about these things on a, on a Sunday uh, or on a Wednesday evening? Is the word of God consistently in our mouths, on our tongues? Do we share the truth of it? Do we share the good news of it uh, with our friends and our colleagues and our families? He also needed to meditate upon God's word. Verse 8, thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now that word meditate carries with it the idea of matter and uh, I've read that Jews traditionally would always read the word of God out loud. Now, we need to meditate upon the word of God. Uh, one commentator has written, I think it was VSB, if we don't talk to our, your Bible, then how do we expect the Bible to talk to us? To matter, meditate there in day and night. Of course, the same word is used in uh, Psalm 1 of the righteous man. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And, and in reality, there are, there are no shortcuts and no gimmicks to no spiritual success. We've simply got to get the grips with the word of God. And it's not just about going to church. We can't do that now anyway, can we? It's not just listening to ministry. It's not just having a few Christian friends. To make a real difference in our Christian experience and to the live, live the lives that we associate uh, with those uh, greats of the Bible, then we must get to grips with the Word of God. Then it will influence our attitudes, our reasoning, our behavior. Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. And fourthly, we discover that he had to obey the word of God that he might be prosperous in his conquest of the land. Verse 7, observe to do according to all the law. Turn up from it to the right hand or to the left. Verse 8, observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now, many of us will know generally what we ought to do as far as uh, the scriptures are concerned. But what about our practice? It's obeying the word of God. And so Joshua had to know and speak the law 
given to Moses. He had to meditate upon it daily. He had to practice it in his life. And as a result, God promised to prosper him. Just wonder, how do we measure success or prosperity? I would rather hope it's not in the same way that the world would measure it. Perhaps we ought to be asking the questions of ourselves when we uh, sit back and review progress over the last year. Do I obey the will of God? Am I empowered by his Holy Spirit? Do I serve Christ for the glory of God? Perhaps these are the measures, and amongst many others, that would indicate our spiritual prosperity. Joshua's experiences, both before and after the 40 years in the wilderness, teach us that we really ought not to feel inadequate. We needn't be anxious and fearful because God has chosen us and God is with us and he equips us with the spiritual resources that we need to do his will. Also, we discover from him that we must take the word of God and its promises seriously. We need to read and meditate, obey and share. And also, we must believe, trust that God is with us. Hebrews 13, 5 again. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always. Now, knowing these things, learning from the experience of Joshua, will perhaps build up our immunity to the grasshopper complex. And then we will always be strong and of good courage. I trust You'll be blessed by uh, the reading of God's word and uh, these thoughts from it.